God. Thank you for coming to tonight on Tuesday night. Wow, there was a good crowd last night on Monday night. You know the Lord's moving when people are coming on Mondays and Tuesdays, praise the Lord. And uh, I know it's just, uh, uh, we're, we're so anticipating the coming of the Lord. So much is happening every day. You know, I said it last night, I do this weekly update. In fact, I'll shoot it tonight after we're done. Uh, it comes out on Wednesdays. And I thought I would do it uh, two weeks. I was in a church in California, and the pastor said, you know, we're going to have a weekly update come here about end times. And, he, and the lady sitting beside me says, well, he's talking about you. I said, well, I'm not doing some weekly update. You're crazy. Well, I started doing it, thought I'd do it two weeks. I've been doing it about 15 years. So, <laughs> yeah, hello. So it, I talk about what happened that week in Israel that points to the coming of the Lord. When I first started, I thought, well, I won't be able to get enough stuff. Now there's too much. You almost need to do it three or four times a week because something keeps happening that points to his return that's blatant, that's amazing, that's in our face, that tells you you're about to see Jesus. Wow, hallelujah. So that's how we started out uh, uh, Sunday morning, went through all the signs. I say we went through all of them. We went through about 10 or 15. There's about 80. On the T-shirts, you can see about 20 of the signs. And, uh, I mean, if you don't want to buy a T-shirt, take a picture of it. I don't care, but at least have the signs. Great witnessing tool. I was sitting by a Navy SEAL one time. And I was talking to them about, uh, you know, the prophecies of the first coming of the Lord, how flawless they were. You know, Jesus was born in Bethlehem of the tribe of Judah and uh, went entered into Jerusalem on a colt and preceded by a messenger, given away for 35 pieces of silver. It was thrown to buy a potter's field. They gambled over his robe, pierced him in his side, wore a crown of thorns. All that was prophesied. And uh, it was dark while he was on the cross. So I'm telling this Navy SEAL that. I said, what do you do about that? It was prophesied. Because the odds of that, I told you the other day, it's 480 trillion times a billion times another trillion. It's 480 with 33 zeros afterwards. In science, it's absurd to think that it happened by chance after that many zeros. This is what this Navy SEAL said to me. He goes, well, they've read those and brought them to pass. I said, excuse me? I said, so they made it dark in the middle of the day while he was on the cross? So, I mean, people will come up with weird responses to, to the flawlessness of God's word. So that's why the, the signs are on the back of the shirt so you can tell people. This is what God said you'd see right now. So we'll go through it for a few minutes. And then the next night service, we got into the rapture of the church and uh, how we'll be caught up. We're, we have, have to be with the Lord. We'll go to the reward seat of Christ, marriage supper of the Lamb. How fun is that going to be? Come back on white horses at the second coming. I guess we go to a couple minutes of horse flying school. You get your, your rudders all set or how that works with a horse. Uh, it'll be intriguing to me. Uh, but then after that, we have what we got into last night, the millennial reign of Christ. Isn't that fun? We see our future. We have a thousand years to reign with the Lord here on the earth. It'll be a wonderful thousand years. How blessed that he'll be the, the king of glory. Isn't it amazing he's going to sit on the throne of his father, David? Isn't it amazing that a human could do something so cool that God's going to sit on his throne? Wow, that you could do the will of God so well that Jesus goes, I'm going to sit on your throne, David. How cool is that? Wow. Because, you know, it pleased the Father that in him, Jesus, would be the, uh, would be the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Wow. Mm. So we got into that last night. Does everybody remember everything about the message last night? You got it all, right? Every single part, right? No big deal. Every little fragment of it, it's just right there in your spirit, isn't it? No big deal. No, we just have a wonderful a lot to look forward to. Remember, hope deferred makes the heart sick. You have wonderful things to look forward to. And that's why when that brother, that famous evangelist told me, he said, Joe, if you preach on the coming of the Lord, you'll just get everybody's hopes up. I said, that's exactly right. Duh. It's the hope, not a hope. It's the hope that purifies you even as you're pure. So we hear about the coming of the Lord to push us to do the will of God in a short period of time. It's an acceleration mentality, not escape theology, acceleration mentality. So tonight we'll get into a little bit more. I'm going to take a little bit of a turn, but we'll do a couple minutes of review and I won't, I won't go too long. I want you to, uh, pastor told me to go to what, by 11 o'clock you said. So we'll stop at 11. No, we, we, have I preached long? Have I preached long? Any service? Okay, good, good. No, that's good. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this hour in which we live at the end of the church age, that we get to see events in the earth that you spoke of in your word thousands of years ago, and we live in the day of fulfillment. So help us. Help us grasp that. Help us see the, the magnitude of your word coming to pass right before our eyes so that we would make adjustments. We would hustle. Uh, we, we make changes in our, our daily walk with you. We wouldn't fit church into our life 
It is our life. So we thank you for those that gathered tonight, Lord, on Tuesday night. Thank you for extra special blessings for them. Their households are blessed. Their jobs are blessed. Everything they set their hand to would prosper. And I thank you for such a peace in their home, Father. It would almost be like special faith. It would be hard to even get agitated about anything. It would be a a taste of what is to come, a foretaste of the glory that's coming, Lord, that will be in your presence for eternity. We thank you that you're here now. You said where two or three are gathered in your name, you're there. So you're here. So we thank you for anyone that might have any problem with their body or their mind. Uh, They can be set free hearing the word tonight. We thank you for it. Jesus, we magnify you. We exalt you. If you be lifted up, you'll draw all men unto you. So we thank you for being the king of glory. We thank you for that, Father. In Jesus' wonderful name, everybody said amen. Amen. You know, to give you a little bit of a, a, a background deal as we get into what we started with, listen to how wild this is, and you can see how the church uh, functioned with this. The Bible says, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Okay, 1907, Chaim Wiseman uh, for the British government, he invented TNT, helped them win World War I. They were so blessed, they said, what do you want? He said, I want a homeland for my people. Okay, what happened in the church in 1907? Azusa Revival. Okay, 1917, Allenby flew into the land of Israel. We talked about that the other day. An Australian general, they passed out those leaflets, said, Allenby's coming, Allenby's coming. They didn't know that in Arabic, the name Allenby meant a prophet sent from God to deliver you your land. So 1917, the land gets turned over to Israel, and, and the British government did what we call the Balfour Declaration. So they were, it was declared, this is your land. Same year, Kenneth Hagin's born. The Lord t- t- told his mother to name him John. Didn't name him John. Said he would have a part in getting the earth ready for the second coming. She named him Kenneth. Don't you love that? Yeah, I don't like John. I like Kenneth. So we talked about Hagen. What does Hagen mean? One to go in the Hebrew. Hagen means one to go before to prepare people for the coming of the Lord. So you got that happening at the same time. 1948, Israel's regathered, made a nation. The fig tree budded. That's the biggest deal ever. That's the one thing in the Bible God said you'll say that he can't do. He's already done it. This is what's cool. What happened in 1948? Healing revival. Ten years of miracles. I mean, A.A. A. Allen, Raymond T. Ritchie, William Branham. That first service I heard Kenneth Hagin in 1970, I didn't even know. I was at the headquarters for the Voice of Healing. Uh, walked in. There's a picture of A.A. A. Allen, William Branham. Back then, uh, Gordon Lindsay, which had uh, the, the Bible school there, Southwest Assemblies of God. He quit his ministry just to handle William Branham's ministry because Branham had such crowds they couldn't couldn't, I mean, the people in wheelchairs would coming up. Uh, one of A.A. Allen's meeting, remember Brother Shambach worked for him? Don't you love how they used to do I can't believe I'm going to do this. But Brother Shambach would go, folks, every single one of you, under the sound of my voice tonight, the Lord will fall, the power will fall, and those of you that have maladies from hell, you'll be healed tonight and tonight only. I mean, it was such showtime, go time. And then they, you know, they'd go, Man's God, man, God's man of faith and power right here. You don't have any trouble. All you need is faith in God. And Brother Allen would get up, he'd take somebody, he goes, look at this man, the devil's all over or he'd snap his back and the guy would get instantly healed. I mean, one, one, of, one, of, uh, 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 one of the miracles that A.A. Allen had happened in 1950 in Birmingham, Alabama. There was a woman that had come from Tennessee. Her baby was deformed, had no arms, no legs, had no eyes, had a hole for her nose, hole for her mouth. And she'd been telling Shambach, when's A.A. Allen going to pray for my baby? And Shambach said, I'll tell you what, if, if your prayer card's not, number's not called out, I'll make sure your baby gets prayed for. Come the last night of the meeting, uh, Brother uh, Allen got up. And he said, we're going to take up a faith offering. And, and Brother Shambach didn't really know what that was. And, and basically said, well, it's an offering you can't afford. That woman came down and put like $10 in the bucket. How do I know that? Brother Shambach got off the organ, walked over there, and, and looked in the bucket to see how much money she put in. He was concerned for her. And I want you to see this. This is how crazy. This is corresponding with Israel being regathered. Okay, so uh, A.A. A. A. Allen's up preaching. He's in the middle of his message. Wait a minute. Here comes a word of knowledge. He goes, I'm, I see a car coming from the Tennessee, coming down over the Alabama border. He said, I see these doctors in OB ward. They said the baby can't live, but in fact, it's alive tonight, it, but it's not, not doing well. And Shambach goes, that's that woman has been hammering me all week. That's that baby is deformed. They brought the baby down right there in front of Brother Shambach, Brother, Brother, Al, Brother Allen. Brother Shambach said, I normally close my eyes when I pray. He said, but I wasn't going to miss this miracle. He said, it sounded like cordwood. Snap, snap. Snap, snap. Legs grew out on that baby. Arms grew out on that baby. Swirls came on the baby's eyes. The baby got recreated right there in front of everybody. 
So the place is going wild, okay? This is 1950, Birmingham, Alabama. So the place is going crazy. I did several meetings with Brother Shambach. Tell me, tell me the whole story, Brother Shambach. So uh, he goes, well, that was cool. He said, but all of a sudden, everybody knew to turn. They looked at the stretcher section, and every 300 some odd people on the stretcher sections instantly made whole, come off the stretchers. <laughs> Without a hand laid on them. Okay, everybody's rejoicing over the baby, rejoicing over the stretcher section, and they knew to turn around. They turned around. There was a busload of blind people that were late getting to the meeting. This is midway through his service. The busload of blind people couldn't find the tent. I know they had someone driving them that could see. Come on, I can see that. Look at you going, no, the driver wasn't blind. <laughs> Dear Lord. So they all turn around. Every single one of the blind people coming off the bus when they walked in the back of the thing got their sight just like that. What's the big deal about that? Israel's made a nation, healing revival for 10 years. Okay? And what does the Bible say when Israel's regathered? What does Romans say? What did Paul say? What does it mean? What does it mean for us? Life from the dead. It means resurrection, means rapture. Now, see, Hollywood has a sense that there's a resurrection coming. You got the walking dead, you got, you got zombies, you got all this stuff. They don't know how to interpret it, so that's how they interpret it. Why? There's a resurrection coming. The church is about to depart, we're about to be caught up. So we got into all the signs about that. So in the 48, Israel's regathered. In the Hebrew revival, 67, Jerusalem's going back. What happened in 67? Charismatic renewal. All of us are a part of God moving into the denominations. And all of a sudden, we all came out of that to have the Lord do what he wants to do. And what a blessing to be a part of the last day move of God. Then you had the word movement, the Holy Spirit pouring out. It was a yielding time. Why? Because we're about to leave. So we have a lot to do in a short period of time. So grab your Bibles and turn if you would. You just pick out the chapter once again. We'll see if you're flowing. Praise the Lord. I want to go in a, 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 a direction tonight to show you what, how, do, how we're supposed to look just before the coming of the Lord. So go to James 5 and we'll get into this because we didn't go through the signs. But remember the first service we got into, Israel was made a nation. Jerusalem was won back. Jesus said the generation that sees those two will not pass away to all fulfilled. So that's remarkable. Two signs. Israel regathered. Jerusalem won back. But then you got the Hebrew language restored. You got the Ethiopian Jews brought back. You got the fertility of the land of Israel. You got the revival of the Roman Empire. You got foxes showing up on the Temple Mount. You had the fish show up in the Dead Sea. When was that prophesied? 2,700 years ago. When did that happen? Last year. You had the Dead Sea turn blood red where Sodom and Gomorrah was. On the Day of Atonement. So uh, you got birds, 172 different species of predatory birds start showing up in the land. So uh, you have all these things. You got Russia going into Crimea, Russia going to the Ukraine. You have everything in position for what's next. And that is Russia coming down on Israel. So that lets us know that the rapture is very soon. So we, we have a lot of a harvest to do. We get double of what the book of Acts was. That's what we're promised. The book of Acts was pretty cool. And what happened in the book of Acts? God used everybody. I mean, the great, thank God for the 12 disciples, but it went on from there. It wasn't just the 12. It was the 70, and then it got multiplied on the day of Pentecost. So you're a harvester. Yes. Let's see. Okay. <laughs> Whoever that was, I'll come for you. Thank you. So, so see, what happens is that means that none of us are exempt. Because we have a tendency to go, well, let so-and-so do that. Let brother so-and-so, let sister so-and-so do that. No, there's no exemption. You're, you're in the army. Could you imagine, uh, my dad volunteered in World War II. The day after uh, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, all their buddies went and enlisted. And once you're in, I could just see my dad, once he enlisted, he goes, I don't know if I signed on for all this. You know, all the stuff you have to go through. But they wanted to protect their country. There was something so bigger than them to protect their country. How much could be bigger than God coming back to the planet? Let me say that again. How much could be bigger than God coming to the planet? So there's some protocol for this. Oh, I, can't, I haven't even got to what I'm going to get to, but just hang with me. This is the appetizer. God coming to the planet. So in the Old Testament, God raised up prophets to bring Israel back because they had fallen away. The priests had fallen away from what they were called to do. So God sent prophets in to, to, to shock them like Elijah and Elisha to bring Israel back. And that's great. But you know what? Uh, when John came on the scene, Jesus said there hadn't been a greater prophet since him ever was, ever will be. They said, are you a prophet? He said, no. They said, are you the prophet? He said, no, I'm a voice, a voice of one crying in the wilderness. And the amazing thing is, is uh, Jesus said there hadn't been a greater prophet since him ever was, ever will be. He said, he's a burning and a shining light. He woke up a dead nation, yet he did no miracle. Wow. We think if we have miracles, we could shake America. John woke up Israel with not a single miracle. And Jesus said, this is what I like, the least in the kingdom of God's got more anointing on him than John the Baptist had. 
Oh, I think I'll do Elvis on that one. Come on. The least in the kingdom of God's got more grace. So you have more grace on you to call America back than John had to wake Israel up. So in the Old Testament, God used prophets. In the New Testament, he uses the believer to be a voice. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go to James chapter 5. With all that, we're going to get rolling here. James 5. You know James 5 so well. It's so good. So let's run down to the latter part of James 5 because he talks about the early and the latter rain. talks about double in verse 11. In verse 16, he says, confess your faults one to another. That would be one of the weirdest services I think I'd ever been to. Have you ever been to a service where, what are we doing tonight? And we're just talking about how, how stupid we are. <laughs> no. Wouldn't that be weird, confessing your faults one to another? Basically he's saying, don't be worried about your limitations in the flesh. Because if you looked at your flesh, you would think, how can I qualify for being a wake-up call at the end of the church age? Because I would automatically think, well, I don't qualify. Well, let's keep going here. He says, uh, confess your faults one to another. Pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man subject like passions as we are. Yet he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. I like this in verse 18. And he prayed again. And the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth their fruit. So he's showing you here, this is a picture of the last day church. Elijah is a type of what we're supposed to look like. Not weird, not strange, not weird prophet eating locust burgers and, you know, camel hair. But people could see that God was with Elijah without him saying a word. He never had to go, hey, God's with me. No, they knew God was with him. You don't hear one word talked about Elijah's preaching, but you hear a lot of words talked about his life. That God was with him. And this is what we look like. This is what we're supposed to look like before the Lord comes back. Not calling down fire from heaven. But look, just as Elijah set the tone for the earth. He said, hey, it's not going to rain for three and a half years. Indicating you'll set the spiritual tone for the earth. If he set the natural rain, you set the spiritual rain. So there's an amount of authority that you walk in that gets the earth ready for the coming of the Lord, and that's your destiny right here before we leave. So I want to focus on something tonight that the early church focused on to have them launch the early church, and if it started that way, it'll finish this way. That's the cool thing. It goes full circle. If you wonder what's the last day is going to look like, go from Acts chapter 8 and go backwards. If you want to know what it's going to look like right before we leave, go to Acts chapter 8 and go backwards. That's exactly what it will look like. That's why prayer is such an important part. Gathering together is such an important part. They gathered together. They lifted up their voice. And the whole place was shaken where they were assembled together. And, and there came out destiny. Lord, stretch forth your hands so that signs and wonders be wrought by the name of thy holy child Jesus. So they didn't say, hey, we're so cool. We can do it on our own. No, they said, Lord, we've got to have some help. we got threatenings. They're, they're putting us in jail. They want to kill us. And what were they threatening them over? Don't preach anymore in that name. They knew that the name brought the same results as his physical body brought. Oh, I might do Elvis on that one right there. That's so good. Preach it, Brother Joe. It's all over you. Here we go. All right, so let's look at this. Go over to 1 Thessalonians. Run with me for just a minute. I won't go long tonight, so just hang with me, okay? Go to 1 Thessalonians and go to chapter 1. And let's look at this for a minute. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Skip down to verse number 4. It's page 255, if you've got a Bible like mine. Hmm. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4. Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost. And in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sakes. Now, I like verse 6. Hang with me. Verse 6. And you became followers of us. That's the word mimickers. Are imitators. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. Now listen, they, they heard such a message that so uh, motivated them that they thought, I can imitate Paul and I can imitate Jesus after one message. Now, I've heard thousands of messages that almost told me I've got to travel with the right guy, I've got to be around the right anointing, and I've got to do all this and that and that to do what I'm supposed to do. Here, they heard one message, and they said, I can look like Jesus, I can look like Paul. That's radical. That's radical. 
That's radical. The, the wonderful thing, it's good to travel with somebody. I worked for uh, two different guys for seven years and, and got around that anointing. Absolutely amazing. One of the guys I was around, the tangible anointing was so strong. If you, thought of, if you, if you didn't think about sports in the prayer line, you'd fall out of the power. He goes, well, you're no good for me. You're not helping me in the prayer line. I had to think about football or basketball or racquetball. If I didn't think about racquetball, I'd be on the ground. So it's good to hang around that anointing. But you know what? Uh, uh, we all can't do that. How many of you can take off five years and go follow somebody? No, you don't have to travel travel with somebody. You got somebody traveling with you. Come on. He he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. (laughs) So here, let's look at this. So here, there's a message they heard that, that completely unlimited their thought pattern. I can be like Paul. I can be like Jesus. That's radical because all the messages I've heard were you've got to do this and this and this right. And you might step into that kind of flow. Am I in the right room? In other words, if you'll do this and this and this, maybe you'll step into that. They heard I can be just like Jesus. What did they hear? A simple message of authorization. Like Elijah had so much authority. That's in Jesus. They said, listen, what did they say about Jesus? Woo, he's a preaching machine. No. They said, listen to the authority at which he speaks. So their simplistic message of authorization said, okay. Uh, Jesus said, I'm not here. Be, be me. And they're like, okay, I'll do that. There's something about that that frees you up. How many of you, I oh, can't believe I'll do this, but anyway. How many of you drove a car before you got your license? I grew up in Louisiana. I hauled hay. I drove on the freeway when I was eight. I mean, I drove the truck. I hauled hay. By the time I was 10 and 11, I drove like I was 65 years old. I've been driving all my life. I had been driving pretty much most of my life from eight to 11. So I couldn't wait to finally in Louisiana, you get your permit when you're 14. And I remember getting, when you get your license when you're 15. But I remember when I got my permit, man, I thought, wow, this is amazing. Because the police car comes driving up like, oh, I'm okay. I'm legal. I'm authorized. It just produces joy <laughs> and, and alleviates fear, freedom, boldness. But what I really like is if you ever been to Germany, I used to go to Germany and preach. I go again this fall. I think I've been there about 35 times. I usually go about twice a year. My sister was running the Bible school there in in Heidelberg, then in Bonn, my sister and brother-in-law. So I'd go preach there on gifts of the Spirit for years and then go preach on end times. What I like about Germany is there's no speed limit. The Autobahn is so cool, you can max it out. There is no speed limit. So one time, John and Michelle drove me from Brussels to Bonn, 160 miles an hour the whole way. All you hear is wind noise. And you got BMWs, you got Porsches passing you at 160, not kilometers, miles per hour. And I thought, this is the coolest thing on the planet. This, there is nothing cooler than this. And there's a sticker on your dash at 160. There's a line through it because you can go faster, but your tires aren't rated for faster. So, you know, uh, this is a mentality, though, for the Germans. I had a pastor. His name is Arthur. He drove me from Zurich to, to Frankfurt, and he pegged his engine at red line for three hours. I said, Arthur, have you thought about letting the engine rest just a little bit? He goes, well, why would I do that? Like I was an idiot for, you know, for, <laughs> I mean, they just drive as fast as you can drive. Why? They're, they're, they're going to max it out. They've been authorized to go as fast as they want to go. You can spot an American, man, an American's going about 75. And they're looking around going like this. Oh, here we go. Because people are going, whoa, whoa, whoa. people are honking at you. Get out of the way. But see, that's the church. The church has got like a 911. They got 500 horsepower. They can go 190, and they're buzzing along in first gear. The church is like this. <laughs> we're authorized to look just like Jesus, and we're buzzing along like this in first gear. See, he, he took the limits off for what we can do. And I'll, I'll show you. Go back to Luke 9. Go back there to Luke. Go to Luke chapter 9 for a minute. He's so good to us and so kind to us. Watch this. And then I'm getting closer to what I'm going to land on. So just just hang with me through the appetizers as we get to the main main course here. Look at at Luke 9. This is so amazing. And I know you know all this. This is nothing new at all. I know that. But I'm trying to show you what we're supposed to look like. Look at Luke chapter 9. Look at verse 1. Page 87. If you've got a Bible like mine. Luke 9, verse 1. Then he called his 12 disciples together. He gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases and sent them to preach the kingdom of God to heal the sick. Okay, how long did it take them to to step into that and to do that? Instantaneous. Five years, two years, year, six months, instantaneous. No delay whatsoever. They started functioning, what? Just like him. Not similar, just like him. It freaked them out, too. (laughs) So uh, you say, well, that's the 12. Obviously, the 12 could do that. That's cool. Okay, go to Luke 10. Go over one more chapter. Look at Luke chapter 10. Look at verse 1. Luke 10, verse 1. 
After these things, the Lord appointed another 70 also, sent them two by two before his face into every city and place, whether he himself would come. Okay, he authorizes the 70. Guess how long it took them to duplicate his ministry? Instantaneous. Six months? No. One year? No. They go to Bible school? No. He said, I'm authorizing you to be just like me. And they went, okay. It so freaked them out that they came and saw him and said, man, the devils are even subject to us in your name. Is this crazy? That's not a big deal. He said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. That's how quick I kicked him out. He said, don't be freaked out about that. Be glad that your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. That's right. Hallelujah. Amen. So that's pretty cool. How long did it take them? Instantaneous. Instantaneous. That means once we find out we're authorized, we can start doing this now, right now, today, tomorrow, the next day. Watch this. Go back to Luke 9. Go to Luke 9, verse 40 something. Look at verse 49. John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in your name, and we forbade him because he didn't follow after us. And the Lord goes, Forbade him not. He that's not against us is for us. This guy hadn't even been authorized, but he had enough brains to see what works. What was he doing? He was doing exactly what the disciples were doing. Wow. With no oversight because he saw what worked. So there's something about this authorization that produces this. Okay, now hang with me for a minute. You with me for a little bit? Because I've got a little bit I want to get into. Just hang with me. Think of Kenneth Hagin. Let's just uh, think of Brother Hagin. You know, I, uh, absolutely amazing. He develops his authority to the point that there was a, a pastor that had full-blown sugar diabetes. Okay, the, the pastor's pancreas is not working properly, so his sugar level is not right, so he's having to manually adjust his insulin. You know how you, you check your sugar level in the morning, you give yourself more insulin or less insulin? That's what a diabetic has to do. So that pastor had, had full blown sugar diabetes, that means his pancreas is not functioning perfectly. Brother Hagen said, This pastor is going to travel with him for two weeks. Brother Hagen said, While you're said, listen, said, while you're near me for these two weeks, you won't register any sugar. And that pastor goes, what? He goes, no, no. While you're near me, you won't register any sugar. And that pastor ate cakes and pies that night. What are you supposed to do that? He woke up the next morning and said, surely my sugar will be messed up. His sugar was normal. He said, that beats anything I've ever seen. This is the craziest thing ever. He told Brother Hagen, what in the world? He goes, I wished I could do that. Brother Hagen said, it doesn't come by wishing. It comes by believing. <laughs> oh, so he developed his authority so much that said, you get near me. You get near me and your pancreas will come alive. That's radical. Now, let me just give you, I'll give you a little bonus thing right here. In John 14, Jesus said we do the same works that he did, and he gave us two keys, authorization and presence. Authorization and presence, okay? Authorization and presence. And those are the two things he said. Ask, demand anything in my name, I'll do it. And he said, I'm going to pray to the Father. He'll give you another comfort. He may abide with you forever. Two keys, authorization and presence. Well, so this authorization, I mean, you think about it. Brother Hagin called it the edge of authority. That you can get near me and an organ in your body comes alive. Two weeks after that pastor got home for being on the road, Brother Hagin, he didn't register any sugar for two solid weeks. There was a residue of authorization working in that guy's pancreas. Eventually, he got a hold of the word and, and got healed of sugar diabetes and found out himself. That's pretty amazing. Okay, now hang with me. Hang with me just a little bit more because I'm getting closer. I'm getting closer. We're, we're stepping into the main course. One year, I was preaching in England. Gosh, this is like 1995. I was preaching on the God Channel. It was one of the, that back then, that was like the only channel in Europe. They were going to interview me on Gifts of the Spirit. So they had this interview guy come to find out. I don't think he was born again. <laughs> come to find out, I think he had a drug problem. <laughs> come to find out, I think it was crazy to get this guy to interview me because he's asking me questions about gifts of the Spirit. And he'd go, holy cow. I'm like, oh, my God, this guy doesn't even know what I'm talking about. So this is a long interview on the gifts of the Spirit on live television in Europe. So I'm sitting there going, God, Lord, bail me out of this deal, you know? So there was an elderly woman walked up to me in our breaks. We'd have a break, and I'd just kind of walk off going, oh, my God, how am I going to do this? She walked up to me. She said, you know, Newcastle's where Smith Wigglesworth got baptized in the Holy Ghost. I said, yeah, I remember that. That's so cool. That's where we are. Just the feeling of that is amazing. That's where Smith Wigglesworth's from. She told me a story about Wigglesworth. You probably heard it. Probably a repetition for you, but Brother Wigglesworth was at a funeral one time. And the, the Lord told him to, to, to raise this lady up. This lady, she's about middle age. The Holy Ghost came on him. We know it's special faith, working of miracles and gifts of healings. The Lord said, raise her up. Well, I hope I don't get feedback. So Wigglesworth goes over and picks this woman up out of the coffin. Do you realize what that would be like if you had a funeral and you go mess with the body? 
one thing to touch the body, one thing to talk to the body. This Wigglesworth picks the woman up and drags her over to the wall, takes her over to the wall, and, he's, and, and, and he said, he goes like this. He goes, walk in Jesus' name. Boom, throws her against the wall. Boom, she hits the floor. Now, right there is when I'd, I'd, have gone, I'd have gone to the family. I'm sorry. I'm an idiot. I'm, an, I'm sorry about this. I mean, could you imagine somebody taking your mother and throwing her against the wall? Have you ever been to a funeral, see somebody mess with the body? I've never seen somebody mess with the body, much less throw the woman against the wall. Throws the woman against the wall. This doesn't phase Wigglesworth. Not phased. Doesn't phase him. He picks her up, throws her against the wall. I said walk in Jesus' name. Boom, she hits the floor. Man, that's where I'd have just gone like that. I'd have, I'd have gone, I said, see you later. So Wigglesworth's not moved, not, not even facing him a bit. He goes over to the woman again. I would have told the family, I'm a beyond an idiot. He goes over a third time to the woman, picks her up, throws her against the wall. I said, walk in Jesus' name. Boom, she comes alive. She's in heaven. She goes, I'm in heaven talking to Jesus. And all of a sudden I hear you screaming at me. Okay, so the whole point of that is, think of Kenneth Hagin. He called it the edge of authority. Wigglesworth, to the point, special faith, work of miracles and gifts of healing is no big deal. What's their message is righteousness, faith, the name of Jesus. Not like the last day's outpouring of the great tabernacle of praise and, and the glory of the overflowing of the da-da-da. We think it has to be like that. Their message is, read Brother Wigglesworth's book on ever-increasing faith. I can give you the chapter headings, righteousness, faith, the name of Jesus. If I got up tonight and said, I'm going to preach on righteousness, <gasps> okay, whatever, give us a little word. No, 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 no. The very platform is what you've gotten put into you the last 40 years. Let me say that again. The very platform that made Brother Hagin tell that man, you get near me, that's what's in you right now. Not five years from now, not 10 years from now, you've got that in you tonight. Oh, come on. It's not like, well, one day I'm going to step into that. They, they, they got this in the early church, and that's what you've been feeding on for 40 years. Yeah. At, one, at what point in your life do you go, I'm doing that? Yeah. 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 Good night, everybody. Drive safely. Start the car. I'll be right there. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Good night, everybody. I mean, how much more do we have to get before we go, I can do this? All right, let's go a little further. I'm, I'm there at the main, main, main service, main course right here. Ready? I'm almost done, almost done. Help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. Go to Matthew 28 and um, look at verse. Well, you pick out the verse. We'll see if you're flowing. Come on. Look at Matthew chapter 28. Look at verse 18. You know the verse so well. Now, hang with me. As we get to that, I'll give you a little bit of background as we go to Matthew 28. Jesus operated in three kinds of authority. But they were all old covenant authority. Okay? Now, now, I want you to get this. Jesus operated in three kinds of authority. But they were all Old Testament. He operated in Adam's authority. He operated in uh, Abraham's authority. Remember Luke 13? All, not this woman being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound low these 13 years. Be loose from this bond. 18 years. Be loose from this bond on the Sabbath. There was enough authority in Abraham's covenant for her to be well. Made him mad that she was bowed over sitting there listening to him teach. Let me say that again. Made him mad that she was bowed over. And here he's telling her she's a covenant woman. So there's enough authority in Abraham's covenant to heal somebody. And then David's covenant. Remember blind Bartimaeus? Blind Bartimaeus goes, don't you love it? Son of David, have mercy on me. And, and he's going like this. And Jesus goes, what do you want? Hello, he's blind. I mean, he's going like this. Son of David. Don't you? The Lord wasn't trying to be weird. He was trying to find out if he knew what he was saying when he said son of David. There was enough authority in David's covenant to get his sight back. See, tonight you're not operating in Adam's authority. You're not operating in Abraham's authority. You're not operating in David's authority. He said before, mm, come on. He said before Abraham was, I am. Yeah. That's whose authority you're operating in. Come on. So that's what you carry. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. All right, Matthew 28, look at verse 18. And you know, this, this is nothing new. This is all, all, we've heard this a thousand times. Matthew 28, verse 18. Jesus came and spake to them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. And then he delegates it right there. Go, therefore, and teach all nations. So we've heard that a billion times. It's, it's, the, it's the Great Commission. We've heard it a thousand times. This is what they heard in the Greek. I looked the words up in the Greek. I'm giving you a right to act. I'm giving you freedom of action. So Jesus goes, I'm leaving, but I'm giving you a right to act on my behalf, and I'm giving you freedom of action. We keep waiting for a move of God. Create your own move. 
John Wesley said, give me 10 men that hate sin and love God, and I will change the world. Yeah. I'm out there on my book table. I don't know if there's any left, but I have a fire pack. It's called Guaranteed to Set You on Fire, and there's packs of matches in there so you can set yourself on fire. Because John Wesley said, let, let God set you on fire. People will come watch you burn. But that went over real good. Good night, everybody. Drive safely. Come on. So, so here Jesus goes. What, what they heard was, I'm giving you a right to act. I'm giving you freedom of action. How many of you, how many of you like Clint Eastwood? Anybody like Clint Eastwood? I like, I like Brother Eastwood, don't you? God bless Brother Eastwood. You know, when I was younger, my dad took me to Clint Eastwood movies. I should not have gone to those. My mom took me to word churches. My dad took me to bars and Clint Eastwood movies. So, so he, this is what he told me. He said, he said, that religion of your mom's, it'll wear off. No, it didn't wear off. Amen. Stick and stay, it's bound to pay, amen, come on. So I went to all the Clint Eastwood movies, and I went to Dirty Harry, I went to Magnum Force, I went to all of them, I shouldn't have gone to them. But the Dirty Harry is my favorite, because you remember the iconic scene, he's got that 44 Magnum, he goes, and all the confusion, feel lucky, punk? He goes, I can't remember if I've shot five times or six times, go ahead and make my day. And man, that guy on the ground thinks he's going to blow his head off. I mean, it's iconic, isn't it? I mean, it's just, it's just like, you, you, it rings throughout eternity, that scene. But you know what, it's fake, it's not real, it's a movie. Okay, so what happened was the, 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 the director told Clint Eastwood, he goes, okay, now Clint, I've got a scene here that I'm going to want you to walk over and you're going to have to point this gun at this guy. And Clint Eastwood probably doesn't even like guns. He's from California. So you can just see him. So it's a fake gun. So you can probably, Clint Eastwood probably said, nah, I don't feel comfortable doing this. I'm from California. You can see it, you know. <laughs> but he doesn't do that. He's a professional. So he's a professional. So he, you know, he, he gets right there where the mark is and the director uh, goes, okay, action. And man, Clint Eastwood takes it. He goes, with a fake gun. A fake script goes into all the confusion. You feel lucky, punk? Man, it's just amazing. See, but it's not real. How dare somebody be bolder with a fake script than you having the holy script? I've got something that's real, that's eternal. See, the problem is, in the movie, we, we, we're, we're the guy on the ground. In the movie, we get thinking we're the victim down there. We're, we're just the lowly victim. He's going to shoot us. Well, you get some word in you, then all of a sudden you start thinking you're Clint Eastwood. But you know what? In the movie, you're not the guy on the ground. In the movie, you're not Clint Eastwood. You know who you are in the movie? You're Jesus. You're his stand-in. <laughs> Wouldn't it be weird, though? Well, how come Christians don't, don't, aren't, aren't a good stand-in for the Lord? They don't know their lines. Could you imagine Clint Eastwood going, in all the confusion, do you feel lucky? He wrote it, had to write his lines down his arm. Wouldn't that be weird? In all the confusion, do you feel lucky, punk? No. It's kind of hard to be bold if you don't know the lines. Right. <laughs> don't get mad at me. Don't get mad at Don't you say, hey, we're not going to get mad at you. How I many of you know all the definitions of the gifts of the Spirit? He said, don't be ignorant about those nine manifestations. You know all the definitions? Mm-mm-mm-mm. <laughs> Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. Come on. So we are, that's our arsenal. That's our equipment. You're authorized. You're platform for the gifts of the Spirit. Like Wigglesworth, we're basic authority. I remember I was in a meeting in Greensboro, North Carolina. I had a word of nausea. that a woman was in a car wreck. Damaged her shoulder, damaged her back. I called it out. She came walking down. I felt exactly what a special faith. Just like I can tell when I have my coat on, I can tell when I have it off. This coat came on me. It's a knowing for her. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. This is Ed Taylor's the pastor's name. I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. How many of you have never seen a miracle before? And about 10 or 15 people raised their hands, you know. And I said, okay, come on down, gather around this lady. And I mean, you know, I said, it's okay. If you've never, it's oh, don't worry. If you've never seen a miracle, come on down, you'll see this. Now, this is not my faith. My faith says, glad you came tonight. We'll lay hands on you, you'll recover, not come down and watch this miracle. Because that's special faith in operation. So the lady's standing right there, and the Holy Ghost had slugger on the back of the neck. She's standing right there with these people all around her. I went like this, and I went, kapow, but be healed in Jesus' name. She started doing the chicken and the swan. I started going like that. Started going back and forth like that. She goes, my God, my God, my God, my God. I, go, I told the people around her, I said, there you go, right there. I didn't know one of the ladies that were gathered around her was a federal prosecuting attorney. And she was from Pakistan, had just converted from Islam to Christianity. And she said, there's no power in Islam. There's power in Christianity. I preached in Ohio a few weeks later. There's her and her husband. He's a defense attorney. She's a federal prosecuting attorney. Preached in Galveston. There she is right there. Preached in Iowa. There they are right there. See, see people that convert from Islam, they want to see power. See, you, you've been authorized to be just like him. You've been authorized to be just like him. Now, hang with me. I'm closing right now. Gosh, I've gone a long time. Everybody, everybody still with me for a couple more minutes? Just a couple more minutes and we'll, we'll dismiss.
I remember there was a meeting I was going to preach in with a buddy of mine, uh, Ross Roberts. He's crazy. He made me be in the ministry. He literally made me go preach. With, I mean, one of the meetings we were in in uh, Charleston, all these, I could tell you all the names of the ministries, you know every one of them. So he's making me preach. So I'm preaching along. I had a word of knowledge that a woman had a growth in her chest. I called it out. She comes walking down. The Holy Ghost says, and Ross is holding the microphone for me like this. He's standing beside me. The Holy Ghost said, tell her to go pour water on that growth and it'll disappear right in front of her eyes. And she looked at me, kind of blinked a little bit. I said, no, this is special faith. I said, lady, you go right now and you take off and you go to the restroom, take a lady with you to witness it, pour water on that growth. It'll disappear right in front of your eyes. And Ross says to me in my ear right here, oh my God, there goes the budget for the meeting right there. <laughs> So, so that's what he said. That's what he said in my ear. He goes, oh, he goes, I mean, because all, I mean, he's free. He goes, oh my God. So that lady takes off and, and special faith wears off. And I, I just told a lady to go pour water on herself. Have I lost my mind? I'm just walking around. Meh, 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 you know, I, can't, I, can't, I can't even think, you know. So she comes running back through the back door. She said, I poured water on that growth, disappeared right in front of my eyes. So leading up to that, Ross and I are going to go do this meeting in Thunder Bay, Ontario. I wasn't full-time in the ministry. I was ushering in a church in Tulsa. Didn't want to preach. Ross is making me go preach, okay? So I'm not in the ministry. I'm ushering in Tulsa, not in the ministry. We get there to, to Thunder Bay. The news media met us when we walked off the plane. They had the cameras out like this, and I said, they want to interview us. I said, don't interview me. Interview Ross. Well, of course, Ross, he does Elvis Presley. He gets up there just like this, does his arms, his legs like this. He goes like this, and I just turn around like, oh, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And it, you've, you've seen this before. He got that wild preacher look, and he goes, I dare you. I dare you to bring the sick from all the lakes around. Bring the lost, bring the sick, bring the maim. I dare you to come. God will heal you. I'm like, oh, God, Ross, just invite them. Don't, 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 don't. I mean, I, I'm talking, you know that crazy preacher look? He had that wild, Rah! you know. I, I was just like, oh, good Lord. And so I didn't know that they had posters all over town, Jesus is your healer. There's posters of me and Ross. I still got, got the poster in my office to this day. I mean, gosh, that was ugh, almost 40 years ago. So, so we get there to the meeting. I preached Sunday morning. It was hideous. It was so bad. I had a lady walk up to me and said, don't try to do this for a living. I said, I, said, I got it. I got it. I said, you're not the first lady to tell me that. So she's like fifth or sixth. I said, oh, I, get, I, I get it. It's awful. I know. I'm sorry. So, so it was horrible. So, so we came back. I mean, it's bad. I mean, <laughs> People are doing like this while you're preaching there. <laughs> slit, slit their wrist. No, no, keep going, Joe. <laughs> so, it was so, so we come back Sunday night, and, and Ross is going to preach, and the music was so bad, he wouldn't come out. It, it was, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm standing right here. I go, Ross, you got to come in. The music was so bad, he was waiting in the background because it was all ching a ling a ding It wasn't anything about Jesus. And he goes, he goes, I can't even go out there. I said, Ross, you have to come out there. You're supposed to preach. Come out here. Come on. He goes, I can't do it. So I, I walked out there and stood by myself thinking, Ross, come on, man. So I'm standing there thinking, come on, Ross, get in, get in here. All of a sudden, I'm, I'm standing there. Look up, and I had discerning of spirits happen. Looked up and saw two huge angels standing right over here like this. I was about right there, and they just looked down at me just like this, about eight or nine feet tall, radiating in the glory of God. Now, I grew up in a home where my mother said, don't ever ask an angel to appear to you. He'll appear as an angel of light. So I'm like fighting this because this manifestation, I'm like, no, 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 I'm a word guy, I'm a word guy, I'm a word guy, get away from me. But these two angels stand there staring at me, looking at such purpose like they're there for a purpose. I'd look up at them, and I just duck my head, and I go, hmm. This is interesting. I look up at them. They're still there. Looked over to the side, and there was a whole, the, the children's church was in the meeting that night, and there were angels all around the kids. So I'm thinking, okay. And, and when I start traveling with that guy, I start having discerning of spirits happen, so I think, I'm losing my mind. Well, these angels are standing there. Ross's still not in. So finally, Ross comes walking in. He goes, you got something? I go, nope, nope, nope. Don't have a thing. Don't have a thing. It's all over you. Preach, <laughs> preach for it. Don't have a thing. I, I, that's what I said to him. I said, no, it's all over you. Go for it. Woo, woo, woo. <laughs> So he, he gets up and, you know, he starts preaching and uh, <laughs> the Holy Ghost said those angels had come to deliver a woman a new heart. I thought, well, that's cool. Ross will call that out at the end. This lady will get a new heart. How cool is this, you know? So he finishes and, and doesn't have anything. He goes, you got something? I said, well, okay, I guess so. I said, there's, 
I got up and said, there's a, a, someone here, you need a brand new heart. This lady got up, came walking down. Man, she had congestive heart failure. She looked like she's going to die if I could pray for her. You've seen people that are just about to go like that. I'm like, she, it just did not look good. I said, Lord, you better heal her. You better heal her quick. So she's walking down. As I walked over to her, laid hands on her, and uh, she fell out on the power, laid on the floor, and hopped up. You know how you usually have guys kind of grab you? She hopped up, went back to her seat, kind of like this. I'm like, wow, who, what's up with this lady? Ross gives the altar call. That lady came down and her whole family and gave their life to the Lord. So she gets healed and saved right there. It was just cool as I'll get out. But that's the way it's supposed to be. So that was Sunday night. Monday, she goes the, to the cardiologist, and she goes, we find this out later. She goes be bopping in because our meeting is Sunday through Friday. She goes to the cardiologist on Monday. She goes be bopping in. He, the cardiologist said, what happened to you? She goes, I went to this crazy church service. She, go, she goes, I'm healed. He goes, I'll be the judge whether you're healed or not. He did an EKG, did another EKG, did another EKG. She said, I'm not paying for this. <laughs> and that's what she said. She was adamant. And the doctor said, I don't understand this, but you have a heart of a 17-year-old. She said, you have a brand new heart. The doctor was so freaked out, he called the news media, and the news media came on Wednesday. You remember how, you know, it was like a circus service, you know, do, 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 like flying young man on the trapeze. I, it was the, cra- I was just sitting there going, oh God, of course the news media is there, that service, that's just, you know, it scared me and I'm not afraid of anything. And I'm like, oh my God, Lord, get me through this service and I'll serve you all the days of my life. <laughs> So, so they were there that day, of course. Well, we come to Thursday and come to Friday. We came Friday. You know how you have a four-year just before you come in? Ross and I came to the four-year on Friday night to come in. We could not get in our own meeting. There was people everywhere. A lady brought me a purple amethyst. There were people with crystals, people with candles, all kinds of new age people everywhere. I thought, what in the world's going on? The paper came out that afternoon. Angels bring woman new heart. Christ redeemed her from the curse of the law. That's where all these people came from. Ross preached a simple gospel message that night. All these people ran down and gave their life to the Lord. So, so what was it? How do, we, how do we have results like that? Great preaching? No. Lady told me, don't even think about doing this for a living. Yeah. So, so see, we, how, how do we have, you know, we, we think it has to be perfect utterance, you know, I tell you, sham, no. How, how do we have that? Ross dared them to come. He set the tone for the meeting. See, and see, you, you set the tone for what you're going to do this year with your, with your authority, with your authorization. You can set it wherever you want it. You can, you can function kind of like Jesus. You can function similar to Jesus. Or you can function just like Jesus. Whose body are you in? Are you in a body of unbelief? I'm not. I'm in the body of the king. Mm. Mm-mm-mm. All right, I'll give you one more. We're closing right now. I was preaching in Pittsburgh. Stopping right now. Stopping, stopping. Wow, 830. I'm stopping. 828, whatever it is. I was preaching in Pittsburgh over the years, and I prayed for a little baby that had Down syndrome, and the baby got healed. So it was so cool. The doctor said the chromosomes had to change. So the parents are so freaked out that it doesn't have Down syndrome anymore. They had a 13-year-old son. They said, hey, would you pray over him one night? I said, sure. He didn't have Down syndrome, but it's good to bless a 13-year-old. Amen? Am I in the right room? So that night, I preached about heaven. I never preached about heaven. I remember as long as I live, I pre- and the kids weren't in the meeting. They were out in their class. So finished the meet, meeting on heaven, and the 13-year-old comes in, and I knew it was time to lay hands on him because we're at the end of the service. I said, well, we're, let's bless him, you know. I prayed what my mom taught me to pray. His disciple taught the Lord, great is the peace and unstirred composure. He delights himself in the Lord. The Lord calls him to ride on high places of the earth. But I went through some word. I said, Father, he'll do your will all of his life. He fell out under the power, just laid there for a little bit, and it was cool. We're done with the meeting then. And I said, that was it. He's laying there on the ground. He's ever seen a golden retriever? I have a golden doodle. You ever seen a golden retriever sleep? You know, they, they dream, you know, and they move around, you know. That little kid was like moving around on the floor. And they go, what do we do? I said, well, let him enjoy it. He's just out on the power. Well, man, after about 45 minutes or so, everybody's going home. You know, we, we're time to leave. He's still out cold. He's moving around like a golden retriever. They said, what do we do? I said, well, haul him home, I guess. So they picked him up. Threw him over, Dad threw him over his shoulder, took him out to the car. Middle of the night, the kid wakes up. Hey, I went to heaven. They said, shut up. Go to sleep. You know, <laughs> you know, it's the middle of the night. You know, he's screaming, I went to heaven. Well, that's what I preached on that night, but he wasn't in there. He said, no, no, I went to heaven. I saw Grandpa. He said, Grandpa took his biscuits and gravy, and he took the biscuits, and he scraped the gravy just like that. I said, that's how Grandpa ate his biscuits and gravy. He said, that was cool. It wasn't as cool as this. Jesus came walking in. He had a gold stick. He said, a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of my kingdom. You know what he told that 13-year-old? He went over to him and said, I don't have any authority in the earth. I gave it all to my church. God. Tells that 13-year-old, I don't have any authority in the earth. I gave it all to my church. 
That 13-year-old got up the next night. He didn't do Elvis. He didn't go, I tell you, I got the authority. No, he didn't do that. He got up and said, you know, the Lord showed me he gave us all authority. So you have a right to act. You have freedom of action. And you set the tone. Let's do this. Let's set the tone. What do you want in 2023? Think of about three or four desires, and let's do this. Let's set the tone. I think of a church. I think of what you God, God's given you guys. Look at this building, and I'll, I'll speak over what I believe to be things for your church, and then I'll get to what's on my heart. I'll speak over my grandchildren. Then I'll speak over my, my daughter. Then I'll speak over my wife. Then I'll eventually get to my life and maybe get to what I'm supposed to do. But right now, let's pray over the church for just a minute, and then I want you to get some things in your personal life. Think of about three or four things that you want to set the tone for this year. It might be, might be more joy. It doesn't even matter. It might be more energy. It might be uh, uh, less hurting horses like uh, Darren would do. <laughs> I'm messing with him. That's an inside weird joke. <laughs> he likes to hurt horses. I don't know what to do. He does. I'm just kidding. <laughs> he doesn't either. I mean, it might be something, it might be something unusual. It might be, something, it might be a, des- a desire to go snow skiing in the Alps. I don't know. The Lord doesn't really care. He loves you. He wants you. Mm-hmm.